Today's podcast of Hellben for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Hellben for Horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. An executive officer for a large financial company is being televised in a live press conference. He's the face of a corporation which has been deeply involved in the largest economic meltdown in recent history. He is a disgraced public figure, sent out there to take the 40 lashes from reporters and try to put a positive spin on the news. Even though he has on an awkward smile, he is agitated and nervous. He clutches an old-fashioned briefcase. In the midst of the grilling from the reporter, the executive stops smiling, and he decides to go off script. You want me to be honest? You're right. The public should be worried. This will be impossible to fix. He then reaches into the briefcase and pulls out a revolver. There is chaos off camera, and he calmly waves people to stay away, to calm down. He then puts the barrel in his mouth and pulls the trigger. The blast is over in a split second. The executive's lifeless body stays propped for a moment in the chair. Blood cascades out of his nose. A part of the exit wound can be seen. He then falls out of frame. Are you Googling now to see if you missed something? Let me calm you down. This was a scene I just watched in the new cable television show, Mr. Robot. That didn't really happen. Or... I'd like to tell you that didn't really happen, but it did. Because as I watched that scene, I had a very specific memory. When I saw that blood cascading from his nose, I could only think of one name, R. Bud Dwyer. Those of you under 30 might not know that name, and in fact, the name might be forgotten. But you probably heard about what R. Bud Dwyer did. On January 22nd, 1987, R. Bud Dwyer called a press conference. He was the state treasurer of Pennsylvania, and he was convicted of taking bribes. Everyone assumed that the press conference was held so Dwyer would resign. Instead, R. Bud Dwyer pulled a 357 Magnum out of a large manila folder from his briefcase. He then puts the barrel of the gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger. Dwyer is killed instantly, but his body is propped up by the podium right in front of a television camera. Dwyer's lifeless eyes stare out. The exit wound can be seen. Blood pours from his nose like a waterfall for a very long time. Now, I haven't thought about R. Bud Dwyer in decades, but that image on Mr. Robot brought back that horrifying broadcast from 1987 just for me. It's an example of what I call a stinger, a visual nod to a real event that can unconsciously creep you out. Now, Mr. Robot isn't about the 1980s. It's a contemporary story of a cyber vigilante who may or may not be mentally ill, and he may or may not be capable of taking down the world economy by erasing the world's debt. Mr. Robot taps into our current social climate, where debt is the cancer of the new generation. And after the crash of 2008 and the bailout of those who seem to be the villains, there is a growing doubt about our leader's motives. But suddenly... Anonymous hackers appear on the scene. Banks and corporations and even governments seem incapable to defend against them. At first, the hackers seem to be liberators, blowing the whistle on the dirty secrets of power. But as time goes on, we can't be sure of the motives of these hackers because they are autonomous. They pick what they release and when they release it or if they release it. They are beholden to no one. They are gods in the machine we built with our global digital village. Our contemporary anxiety is that we are no longer in control. But the stinger in Mr. Robot reminds us that this is not a new anxiety. 
and that history tends to repeat itself. Between 1986 and 1989, nearly half of the savings and loan banks in America crashed. The banks basically ran out of money due to poor investments. They hid this by getting financiers to make even poorer investments in high-risk junk bonds. They pretended nothing was wrong until they couldn't anymore. To everyone's surprise, taxpayer dollars were used for a bailout. Sound familiar? And then a former DEA agent leaked a sensitive document that showed the Reagan administration exchanged weapons for U.S. hostages with the country of Iran. There was a manhunt for the whistleblower. He was considered an enemy of the state. Sound familiar? Sorry, I didn't mean to get political. And I didn't, by the way. All I did was state some historical facts and shared some opinions about the current social climate. But over the last 30 years or so, social issues have been taken over by the politics of both parties, like pod people and invasion of the body snatchers. And that's to the detriment of everybody. And this brings up one of the reasons I think horror films are culturally significant. In a time when people check to see whether the news item is red or blue before reading it, horror can cut through everyone's defenses just as good as any cyber hacker. Since its beginning, horror has consciously or unconsciously commented on the social climate it was created in, because horror's job is to upset the apple cart. It can't help itself. By its very storytelling nature, horror is naturally built for allegory and metaphor. Ignore the cautionary tale at your own risk. And the best horror films use the anxieties of a time period to push that apple cart over. Now, before I get rolling on this, let me say that I believe that great horror is as interpretive for an individual as it is universal to a culture. In other words, a horror film can hit you on a deeply personal level and at the same time still have broad appeal to a wide audience. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein can be interpreted as a cautionary tale against science overstepping its boundaries. It can also be read as a cautionary tale against the dehumanizing effect of the Industrial Revolution. Both are equally valid, unless Mary Shelley wrote down exactly what she was trying to say. But Frankenstein's appeal is so universal that the story is still relevant today, and each generation can add a new interpretation. Because it's a really great story that is simple to relate to, and all that interpretation is just subtext. Now, you don't have to see the subtext in Joy Frankenstein or any other great horror story, but... I celebrate those filmmakers who reach for the higher bars of storytelling because I feel that horror can reflect the culture just as well as a standard drama can, and sometimes even better. I think we've all seen message movies where it's almost all message and very little movie. Their intentions might be sincere, but they are as subtle as a tire fire, and the end result is that they only preach the converted. Horror can talk about the same subjects and never feel like a polemic. Now, I'm not a fan of labels. If you've been listening to my podcast for a while, you'll notice I rarely use the word genre. I usually try to just say horror movie or horror book because that's what it is. Genre is just a style, a technique of how a story gets told. And that means all art is in a genre. But you never hear anyone say drama genre. Somewhere along the line, genre became a label, a category. And once something is labeled and categorized, it's easy to put it up on a dusty old shelf and ignore it. I find labels problematic because sometimes labels are wrong. A case in point is Eli Roth's Hostel. It is almost always labeled as a xenophobic film. It's a movie that tapped into the growing xenophobia in our culture, but I disagree that the movie itself is xenophobic. It's ugly and violent and in poor taste at times, but I think the movie taps into the reasons some of us worry that the world is out to get us, the things we don't want to admit. So a quick synopsis. Hostel follows two American college students as they travel through Europe. They hear about a hostel in Slovakia that is filled with beautiful women, so they decide to go there. Of course, it's a trap, and the students are held prisoner by a group of ex-secret police that services a secret club. The members of this secret club pay to fulfill their fantasies of murdering a human being. Like I said, ugly and violent and in poor taste. And if one only went off that description, it does sound like the white slavery exploitation films of the silent era. 
So this is where context, intent, and setting matter. Actually, watching the movie matters. First, let's look at our protagonists. These students are shown mocking the local culture, going wherever they please, and basically just looking for a good piece of foreign ass. They're shown as ugly Americans, not blameless victims. And the other victims that are held hostage for this elite club are from all different countries. What they have in common is that they are young and traveling under the radar, pretty anonymous in the big picture. Now, who are the members of this secret society? They are an elite group of international businessmen, people who can pay a huge sum of money to fly into Slovakia, murder someone, and then fly home. Industrialists. We meet Dutch and Japanese businessmen. Most importantly, we meet an American businessman who is eager to kill one of our American students who has been tied to a chair for this businessman's convenience. Why is it important that they are foreign businessmen? Well, let's talk about the location the movie is set in. Of all the places in Europe, this film is set in Slovakia. Now, Slovakia used to be part of Czechoslovakia back when it was under the control of the USSR. It became its own country during the peaceful Velvet Revolution of 1993. Now, when the Soviets left, Slovakia was thrown into extreme poverty. All the Soviets left were abandoned buildings. Those empty buildings used to be Soviet prisons and secret police interrogation stations and mental hospitals. Desperate to change the economic tide, the Slovak government sold off their state-owned companies and created a flat tax to entice foreign investors. Those abandoned buildings got filled by foreign-owned manufacturing businesses. And, of course, all of the revenue and profits went back overseas with the businessmen. To this day, Slovakia is the second poorest nation in the EU. The working poor are under the poverty level. Homelessness is a huge problem. In fact, the Slovakians we meet in the film are actual street kids known as the Bubblegum Gang. In the film, our protagonist escapes the old Soviet prison that he was held in right after he kills the American businessman who was trying to kill him. He is chased by the guards who are old Soviet police officers who just work for a new boss. And then our protagonist is rescued by the Slovakian people in the form of the street kids. So, xenophobia is defined as a deep-rooted fear towards foreigners. But the bad guy here isn't the people of Slovakia or any one ethnic group. The bad guys are rich overseas businessmen who come in to feed off what's left of a struggling nation. And they just see poor people as playthings, regardless of their nation of birth. The bad guy is an institution profiting off others' misfortunes. Hey, you can hate hostile for a bunch of reasons. Just hate it for the right ones. Now, why would someone label it xenophobic? Because if they say they hate it because it's vulgar or ugly, it's just their opinion. But if the movie is xenophobic, it says there's something wrong with you if you like it. Because when Hostel came out in 2005, its sensationalistic exploitation movie premise shined a light on a real worry. We worried that, just maybe, we Americans were running out of friends in the world. We worried that our government alienated world leaders and forced the hands of our allies to support a questionable war. We worried about American private sector companies that profited on the chaos we left in our wake. But I digress. Of course, horror movies have always been accused of picking at the scabs of what ails us. They tend to find that unspoken worry or that unconscious guilt that resides in all of us and then brings them to the surface. Now, what you feel worried about or guilty about might not even be real or even true. But just like in a bad dream, what's going on deep down inside you can feel pretty real. And that's what the artists in 1920s Germany were going for with the German Expressionism movement. The goal was to give expression to things that were beyond words and to bring that internal emotion to the external world. When Germany surrendered after World War I, the Allied nations put very strict economic sanctions in effect to pay for a costly war. These sanctions caused massive damage to the infrastructure, including food shortages. 700,000 Germans starved to death after the war was over. The German people were beaten down, depressed, and underneath it all, angry. And out of that came the cabinet of Dr. Caligari in 1920. The story revolves around a hypnotist named Caligari who brings a sideshow to town. 
The show features a somnambulist named Cesar who answers audience questions while under hypnosis. Someone in the audience asks how long they will live. Cesar says, until dawn. Of course, that audience member is stabbed to death at night. And then other murders start happening. The director was Robert Ween, and he brought the look and feel of expressionism to the movie. The new Vimar Republic films were done on the cheap, so carefully painted abstract sets could replace costly realistic ones. In the movie, streets are twisting and crooked. There are no straight angles on the houses, and they bend and distort as if they were staring down at the characters. Trees look like clutching hands. Rooms are entirely black except for one slash of light. The look and mood of the film registered with the audience, because after the war, the normal world was distorted and disorienting. Everything felt threatening. Expressionism brought that inner scream to the real world just like a bad dream. Now, the writers of Caligari were Hans Janowitz and Karl Meyer. Both were veterans of World War I, and their experiences turned them both into pacifists. They wrote Caligari as a response to the unchecked, tyrannical power of the government to not only start a war, but also have the authority to force men to become killers. So for the writers, Caligari represents the German government, and Cesar represents the average German, trained and brainwashed to kill. But then there's the twist ending. You find out that the narrator who is telling this tale is telling it from an insane asylum. Every character from the story we've watched is in the asylum with our narrator. In this twist, Dr. Caligari is a kindly doctor just trying to help this poor soul who keeps trying to attack him. So there have been varying interpretations of this ending. Is our narrator the collective German people, mad with guilt, blaming everyone except themselves for their fate? Or is the kind Dr. Caligari just the next face of the government, never really stripped of any power? Or is it just a story told by an unreliable narrator in an asylum? Even though the writers had specific deeper meaning in the subtext, the movie was ambiguous enough to allow for different interpretations from the audience, which is why it's remembered as a great silent horror movie and not that silent horror movie about post-World War I Germany. And that brings me to what I consider one of the greatest horror movies and horror ideas ever created, 1956's Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It is a simple story told very well. An alien invasion has started in a small Californian town in the form of plant spores instead of little green men. These spores create pods that can replicate and assimilate human beings. These pod people look the same, but they are devoid of human emotion. How do the pods get you? They get you when you sleep. And sooner or later, everyone has to sleep. I can't think of another movie that has had as many different interpretations of its deeper meaning and yet stands so perfectly on its story alone. It has been seen as a cautionary tale about the loss of individuality through the hyperconformity of the 1950s, or as a cautionary tale about the general loss of empathy in Americans after the Korean War. But the two most popular readings of the movie are in direct opposition to each other. The movie is equally read as anti-communism or anti-McCarthyism. Of course, each and every one of these interpretations is correct because each of these anxieties were real at the time the film was made. The simple story reflected the specific fears of every audience member right back at them. Even if you look at the creators of Body Snatchers, you can't get a definitive reading on the message. The screenwriter, Dan Mainwaring, was a front for blacklisted writers during the McCarthy era. The director, Don Siegel, was very anti-communist. And Jack Finney, who wrote the novel, was just trying to come up with an original science fiction idea. In interviews, director Don Siegel admitted that the movie was allegorical, but he intentionally shied away from any point of view that could be considered political. His feeling was that movies were there to entertain, and he didn't want to preach. Of course, there's another horror film trend that is even more synonymous with the 1950s, the giant bug movie. Even the best of them, like the movie Them with giant ants, are remembered fondly by viewers. They barely register as scary. But the thing that gave birth to those movies is probably the most terrifying and dark specter we've left on history. And the moral dilemma caused by this specter may very well be the root cause of the doubt 
and the paranoia and the polarization of American citizens that made movies like Body Snatchers and the ones beyond that so relevant. On August 6th and August 9th, 1945, the United States dropped two nuclear bombs on two Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The bombings killed 129,000 people. Japan surrendered on September 2nd, and World War II was over. And even though dropping the bomb brought a quicker end to the war and may have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, it left a hard truth for us to swallow. We used a nuclear weapon on people. And debate over whether the ends justified the means split the opinions of scientists and politicians and regular Americans. There was doubt. And there was fear. What if someone dropped the bomb on us? We shattered Pandora's box. If you watch the giant bug movies, they are full of stingers of the atom bomb. The movie Them starts in the New Mexico desert, the desert where the Los Alamos bomb tests took place. In these movies, nature attacks us after science goes too far. We created a weapon that was like the finger of God. Were we afraid God would punish us by pointing back? I think it's interesting that it's a scientist or science that's to blame for the problem. It's never the fault of the politicians or the generals that came up with a battle plan that required an atom bomb as the only way to win the war. You can see this in Howard Hawks' The Thing, how the military distanced itself from the scientist who just keeps making one bad decision after another. You'd think they were never on the same team. The giant bug movies reflected the fear of the bomb itself and what harm it could do. But when we split the atom, we shattered something else too. And giant bugs just weren't going to cut it anymore. By the end of the 1950s, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were executed for espionage with the Soviet Union. Sales of personal bomb shelters skyrocketed. They were in your backyard and only big enough for your family. The World War II veterans who brought home their motorcycles and decided to live nomadically on the road, the first bikers, were replaced by angry gangs. A teenager named Charles Starkweather and his 14-year-old girlfriend went on a killing spree across Nebraska and Wyoming and murdered 11 people. And then, in Kansas, two ex-cons senselessly murdered the Clutters, a family of farmers who were safely sleeping in their beds. This was the middle of the country. Somehow, the center was not holding anymore. Somewhere along the line, control was lost. Suddenly, the monster wasn't just out there somewhere. The monster might just be your neighbor. In 1960, Alfred Hitchcock gave birth to the modern horror film with the movie Psycho. This movie was lightning in a bottle. I think Psycho happened just at the right time to straddle the line between being criticized as trash and being considered groundbreaking. I also think that Psycho is one of the greatest horror films ever made, and perhaps the most influential. But I think that the American public was ready for the strong cup of coffee that Psycho was, because real life was creeping into entertainment, slowly but surely, by way of the television, where Walter Cronkite and Milton Berle were given equal time. The baby boomers were the first generation to grow up with a television on in their homes all the time. So it shouldn't be a major surprise that the movies they made started to dive more explicitly into the images that they saw. And in the 1960s, the news was live and people watched. And what they saw was a shocking, real horror movie happening live. Live. No time for political spin or agenda. Those would certainly come soon enough. But those initial images of assassinations and riots happening live only had one message. The world is falling apart. Peter Bogdanovich's Targets from 1968 is kind of a forgotten film. It did poorly at the box office. But I think it's an important bridge between modern horror and the horror of the 1950s because it contains both. Roger Corman gave Bogdanovich money to direct his first movie, but only on two conditions. One, he had to use footage from a pretty bad Boris Karloff horror film called The Terror. And two, Boris Karloff owed Corman two days of shooting, so he needed to use Karloff in the movie. 
And Bogdanovich had an ingenious idea. He would use footage of the terror to be a counterpoint to the action in a movie about a modern monster. That monster was the mass murderer who walks among us. Bogdanovich decided to reference Charles Whitman, who shot and killed 14 people from the University of Texas Tower. Whitman had done this just one year earlier. The images were still fresh in people's minds. The killer in the movie looks like Whitman. He walks through his day, seemingly in good spirits, as he shoots and kills his wife and mother at home. Instead of a college tower, our assassin hides atop a drive-in movie screen, which happens to be showing the terror, a musty old horror movie in a castle. The killer begins shooting the audience. There are sequences of people dragging the wounded behind cars and people pointing in the direction of the gunfire. They are stingers, replicas to the newsreel footage of the actual tragedy. Bogdanovich made the point in a very literal way that the real news was scarier than fiction. Of course, there was another horror film released in 1968 that reflected the social unrest of the time. And it made its allegory with monsters, not men. Sort of. So much has been written about the cultural significance of George Romero's Night of the Living Dead that I almost don't want to talk about it. But it's probably the best example of a horror movie that certainly has its own subtext and allegory going on, but it doesn't forget to be a horror movie first. It still works as a mean and lean horror film after all these years. And yet, certain images in the film are so provocative that the social commentary can't be completely avoided, even on an unconscious level. To this day, seeing our hero, an African-American man indifferently shot in the head by a white man who mistakes him for a monster, still brings gasps. It still has a sting. After 50 years, sadly, it is still culturally relevant. Now this is where you usually will hear about how the lead part wasn't intentionally written for an African-American man and that Dwayne Jones was the best actor for the role and Romero just didn't change the script. My response is, and, are you kidding me? Not changing the script to point out he's black is an act of genius, especially in 1968. Nothing speaks to the disparity that existed between the races than how nervous everyone got when the hero had to slap a white woman and punch a white man. And knock you a shit if he's white. But this gets brought up because people want to infer that Romero didn't intentionally put any deeper meaning into the film, especially ones they don't really agree with. George Romero was only accidentally clever, as if having it all worked out from the start is how art always works. But Romero had one highly original and influential creation from the very beginning, the modern zombie. He reinvented the zombie by making it a flesh eater, a ghoul, and he created the mythology that if you get bitten by a zombie, you die and become a zombie. Romero has said that in its purest form, the zombie represents revolution, one generation devouring another. It's change you can't stop, and his movies are about how people deal with the problem of change. And Romero has used that central metaphor of zombies as revolution again and again to comment on different decades in his sequels. I will say he has done that with diminished returns. I feel that he was most successful in the original Night of the Living Dead. After all, it was his generation. It was his revolution. He was deep in the thick of it. And he was angry. Because, as he said in interviews about his generation's revolution... We blew it. Night of the Living Dead doesn't end happy. No resolution. And that's why it works so well. Of course, if a horror film uses allegory and metaphor to reflect back the anxieties of one generation, a new generation of audience can reflect something completely new. John Carpenter wrote 1988's They Live as a reaction to the greed is good world of Reaganomics. The movie follows John Nada, one of the working homeless, who discovers that the ruling class of yuppies are actually aliens concealing their appearance to control the human race. Nada finds a special pair of sunglasses that remove the alien camouflage. The glasses reveal subliminal messages in mass media and in advertising and even on the money to make humans a bunch of unquestioning slaves to their status quo. Now, the movie wasn't a hit when it came out but it did find a large cult following in the last decade, and its iconic obey message has become a staple of street art. 
However, not everyone sees the same bad guys that Carpenter did in 1988. Carpenter never uses any terms like yuppies or Reaganomics in the film. There's just the rich, the poor, and the police. But if you saw it like I did an opening weekend in 1988, you knew who he was talking about. So imagine my surprise when I talk with younger fans who believe the aliens represent liberals. I saw the movie in my formative years, living through eight years of protests around government trying to control my choices, a media bias, and rich Wall Street brokers gentrifying neighborhoods and kicking the working class man to the curb. The younger fan said the same thing, except he switched out the political party in control, added political correctness as the subliminal messages, and replaced Wall Street brokers with rich, high-tech cultural elitists gentrifying neighborhoods, kicking the middle class to the curb. A good allegory reflects back the anxieties of the times. And between the time I saw that movie and this young fan did, there was another terrifying and dark specter of history that descended upon us, one that shattered our world just like splitting an atom. On September 11th, 2001, terrorist attacks brought down the twin towers of the World Trade Center and partially collapsed the Pentagon building. The attacks killed 2,996 people. Many of us watched it live, unable to comprehend what we were seeing. Live, no time for political spin or agenda. Those would certainly come soon enough. But those first images of a living hell caused by nameless phantoms only held one message. The world is falling apart. Even when we were able to put names on these boogeymen, the anxiety didn't lessen. Because these boogeymen seemed different. They could be anywhere, and they could strike anywhere at any time. They weren't afraid to die, and they wouldn't be reasoned with. And popular culture found a new spin on the metaphor of the zombie. Now today, it's hard to remember a time when zombies weren't common in our culture, Yet for decades, zombie movies were in short supply and limited to a pretty small cult following until the start of the new millennium. Since 2002, when Danny Boyle's 28 Days Later updated the metaphor, there have been over 250 zombie films made. Now, I mentioned 28 Days Later, even though it's not technically a zombie film, it's about humans infected with a disease made of pure rage, and the infected move fast and fearlessly, just like our new boogeymen do. But given how the infected immediately reminded audiences of zombies, it's a moot point. We are talking allegory and metaphor here. 28 Days Later was the first horror film to blatantly, unapologetically reflect 9-11 back at us. There's the scene where our main character walks into an abandoned downtown London shouting hello to only hear echoes. I remember the day after 9-11 when all air flight was grounded, when cities and banks were abandoned. It was so quiet. In the movie, our protagonist stands next to a billboard and a fence, and they're covered with what looks like thousands of photos of missing loved ones. This echoed the photo walls at Ground Zero in New York City just a year earlier. I think that 28 Days Later hints at a new version of the zombie apocalypse, but Boyle gives us a semi-resolution at the end of the film, and his message is that our problems are created by lack of communication. In Zack Snyder's highly underrated remake of Dawn of the Dead in 2004, there would be no happy endings, and words fall on deaf ears. The opening credit sequence is a masterpiece of using stingers to reflect back our own anxieties. We see a politician being asked questions about the dead coming back to life. Every question he is asked, all he can answer is, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. This was how the first terrifying press conferences were after 9-11 in real life. And then Snyder shows a courtyard full of hundreds of Muslims bowing in unison towards Mecca and the reflection of our deep, ugly fears exposed. Then we see U.S. soldiers dressed in desert fatigues firing into a crowd to protect a politician trying to get on a helicopter. 
And then we see a recreation of a grainy satellite news footage from what looks like Baghdad, which was common during the Iraq war. But here we see the reporter and his team overrun by zombies. One of them bites at the camera. Now granted, the reason that there were 250 zombie movies made in less than 15 years was because the zombie became an all-purpose metaphor. They were used for satire, they stand in for villains of all types, and have even been used as stand-ins for victims. But I think one of the reasons zombies became so popular was because it tapped into the fear that we live in a dangerous world where sudden death is a very real possibility. How would we measure up in an apocalypse? Of course, all of this is interpretation. And as I mentioned before, good horror is as interpretive for the individual as it is universal to the culture. And I agree with directors like George Romero and Toby Hooper and Mick Garris when they say that sometimes you find out 10 or 20 years later what the movie really means. Because sometimes storytellers create something that comes from deep inside their subconscious. And audiences can be affected by movies subconsciously because movies are like dreams. They are affected by the waking world, but not tethered by it. And of course, dreams are always open to interpretation. Thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. For you, the listeners of Hellbent for Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Horror. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me, and I thank you in advance. And thanks for listening. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. If you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Google Play. It really helps. Thanks a lot for listening. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast. It's now available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. You can also keep up with Hellbent for Horror on iTunes at iTunes Podcast. That's on Twitter. You can find more on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and I'm on Twitter at hellbenthorror. You can also find more info on my website, hellbentforhorror.com. Till next time, stay hellbent.